the end of the world is approaching, typhoons, tsunamis, and earthquakes will soon destroy civilization. Only tickets to the art can serve as salvation, but only billionaires can afford them. In 2009, the most powerful flares occur on the sun. To understand this phenomenon, the American scientist Dr. Helmsley comes to India to visit his friend, astrophysicist Satnam Surutani. Together they descend into a copper mine at a depth of more than 3 kilometers. Here, an alarmed Satnam shows Helmsley that after the explosion on the sun, a stream of particles began to heat up the Earth's core. Everything is so serious that groundwater is already boiling from the elevated temperature. According to scientists, this will inevitably lead to a global cataclysm. After that, Dr. Helmsley urgently returns to America to report the impending catastrophe to the head of the presidential administration, Carl Anheuser, as soon as possible. Disregarding etiquette, Helmsley breaks into a hotel hosting a charity event. At first, Anheuser ridicules his concern, but after reading the report, he realizes that the matter is serious. He rushes Helmsley to the U.S. President, Thomas Wilson. Almost a year passes. The President of the United States speaks at the G8 summit and informs the heads of state of secret information about the upcoming end of the world. Immediately after this, the construction of large ark ships begins in the Tibetan Valley, on which the Chosen Ones can take refuge and survive the cataclysm. To clear a place for construction, the inhabitants of the valley are relocated to other settlements. They are convinced that they are going to build a dam in the valley, and information about the end of the world is carefully hidden. Only those who have experience in construction are offered to stay. In 2011, they continue to hide the terrible truth from ordinary people, but the oligarchs are secretly buying tickets for the arks. One ticket costs a million euros. In 2012, the day before the global catastrophe, a Los Angeles-based science fiction writer named Jackson Curtis is unaware of the impending disaster. He rushes to his ex-wife to pick up the kids for the weekend and take them to Yellowstone Park. Meanwhile, a small earthquake occurs in the city, and a crack appears in the pavement. But people continue to perceive what is happening with humor and carelessness. Jackson devotes too much time to writing and barely communicates with his children. Therefore, they are getting closer and closer to their mother's new boyfriend, plastic surgeon Gordon. Jackson understands that going to Yellowstone with the kids is a chance to bond with them. On the morning of the same day, Dr. Helmsley and Anheuser visit the president to talk about the disappointing geological situation in California. Helmsley believes that the Earth's core is warming up too quickly, contrary to his calculations. Perhaps the evacuation would have to begin much sooner than he predicted. To collect additional data, Helmsley, with a group of military and researchers, goes to Yellowstone, because the seismic activity is the highest there. Jackson and the children inspect the suddenly dry lake in the park. At this moment, they are noticed by the military and taken away from the dangerous place to a military base. Here, Dr. Helmsley meets Jackson and the children. He lies that he is leading an ordinary geological expedition, and nothing terrible is happening. During the conversation, Helmsley recognizes Jackson as a science fiction writer, and admires his work. After that, Jackson and the children go to the tent city as if nothing had happened, and Helmsley contacts Satnam, the Indian astrophysicist. Satnam's data indicate that the process of destabilization of the Earth's crust has begun around the world. This means that the evacuation of people to the arcs must begin immediately. Helmsley promises that a plane will come for Satnam and his family soon. Jackson's children are bored in the tent city, the man fails to find a way to connect to them. The kids go to bed, and Jackson spots a crazy radio host named Charlie broadcasting from his van. He speaks of the approaching end of the world. Charlie fills Jackson in on his seemingly crazy idea that the government is hiding the truth from the people. Only a select few will survive, and anyone who has recently guessed about a covert operation was exterminated by the authorities. Charlie even has a map showing the location of the arcs. But Jackson does not believe in his nonsense and returns to his tent. The next day, the quakes intensify and Jackson's ex-wife, Kate, requests that the children be brought home urgently. Meanwhile, Anheuser informs the President of the United States that only four arcs have been built so far, which means that it will not be possible to save a sufficient number of people. Helmsley addresses the heads of all states with a report on the deteriorating situation. The President of the United States announces an immediate evacuation to the ships. Jackson gives the children to his wife and hurries to work. He works as a driver for the Russian oligarch Yuri Karpov. Karpov has tickets for the Ark, so he receives an evacuation text and asks Jackson to urgently bring his twin sons to the airport. One of the boys lets slip about the big ships they are going to survive the disaster on. Jackson immediately remembers the words of Crazy Charlie and begins to believe in the end of the world. He immediately rents a plane from the airport and rushes off to pick up his family. At first, Kate does not believe him, but after another earthquake, the family, along with Gordon, quickly jump into Jackson's car. Los Angeles is completely destroyed right before their eyes, houses are collapsing, and entire blocks go underground. The family only miraculously manages to get to the airport. Here they discover that the pilot of the rented plane is dead. 
Luckily, Gordon has recently taken some flying lessons and will be able to fly the plane. Together they manage to get the plane airborne at the last moment. The unimaginable is happening to the city, it is unlikely that anyone will be able to survive under these rubble. Soon, not only Los Angeles, but also other cities on the coast go underwater. Jackson assures the family that they need to fly to Yellowstone to get a map from Charlie with the location of the arcs. The plane with the Jackson family lands at Yellowstone for refueling. At this time, Jackson himself hurries in search of Charlie. Charlie is not in the van, he is already preparing for the end of the world on the mountain. Jackson asks the madman where the map is and hurries back to the plane. Charlie refuses to evacuate. He continues to broadcast against the backdrop of a huge erupting volcano. At Yellowstone, a real doomsday begins, during which Jackson drives at full speed to the plane. Gordon is already preparing to take off, because it is no longer possible to stay there. Finally, Jackson finds the map, gets out of the van and at the last moment jumps into the plane taking off. Miraculously, Gordon manages to get the plane away from the huge explosions. Jackson examines the map and reports that the arcs are in China. They need a bigger plane to fly there. Meanwhile, Helmsley calls his father and warns him of the impending disaster, even though it's forbidden. The father is brave, asks not to worry about him and touchingly says goodbye to his son. Anheuser hides the truth even from his mother and decides that she would still refuse to evacuate. Massive destruction is taking place all over the world. Thousands of people, distraught with grief, gather to indulge together in prayer, complete hopelessness. Looking at it all, Helmsley considers it unacceptable to continue to hide the truth from people. But Anheuser is categorically against loud statements until the chosen ones are on board the arcs. Anheuser insists on the immediate evacuation of the president, but he retreats to the chapel and refuses to speak to anyone but Helmsley. Men talk heart to heart. President Wilson believes that he has not done enough to save people and decides to refuse the evacuation in order to share the fate of his people. Helmsley boards the plane and reports that the president has refused to leave. Then Anheuser takes command. There is a fight between the men. Helmsley is perplexed by the high-handedness and rigidity of the other man, who in turn believes that excessive sentimentality will interfere with saving humanity. The president's daughter, Laura Wilson, also takes her seat on the plane. She bitterly says goodbye to her father and accepts his decision to stay. Soon President Wilson is addressing the nation. Contrary to Anheuser's assumptions, this does not contribute to the start of riots. The plane under the control of Gordon has already arrived at the airport in Las Vegas. But all flights have been cancelled, so it is not clear how to fly to China. The family of the oligarch Karpov was also waiting for their departure here. Jackson knows that Karpov has tickets for the Ark and begs his former employer to take his family with him. At this moment, Karpov's personal pilot named Sasha reports that he has found a working plane and is ready to fly on it. However, the co-pilot is missing. Jackson advises taking Gordon as co-pilot. The company runs towards the huge AN-500 aircraft, which is transporting cars. Despite the controller's ban and the damaged runway, Sasha and Gordon manage to lift the plane into the air. Meanwhile, the Buddhist monk Nima receives a letter from his brother, who works building arcs. He tells the truth about this construction site, says that he figured out a way to get on the ark without tickets, and asks Nima to bring the whole family to the base. The young monk tells the teacher about this and leaves to pick up his grandparents. The White House is covered with ashes, people are hiding in it. However, each to the last retains a dignified appearance and helps others. President Wilson decides to help a little girl find her dad. The Prime Minister of Italy also remained at home and devotes the remaining time to prayers. But soon a terrible earthquake occurs in the Vatican, which buries millions of people. Continents begin to move rapidly. This causes giant tsunamis around the world. One of them covers Washington. Along with countless people, President Wilson dies there. Dr. Helmsley reports that the base with the arcs will also be underwater in six hours. He also notes that. The Earth's crust has shifted a lot. The South Pole is now in Wisconsin. On board the AN-500, Jackson and Kate have a good talk and forgive each other old grievances. Sasha, reports that the fuel is running out, which means that an emergency landing will soon need to be made. Due to the shift of the continents, their plane ends up in the Himalayas not far from the right place. The, plane loses its engines, and it is impossible to find a place to land in the mountains of Tibet. Sasha asks, everyone to get into one of the cars and exit the rear cargo area of the low-flying plane. Thus, everyone, leaves the board, except for Sasha, who heroically continues to fly the plane. AN-500 lingers on the edge of the abyss, but immediately falls down. Sasha dies. Chinese cargo helicopters fly over the survivors, delivering the animals to the arcs. One of the pilots notices the company and goes down. Karpov shows the Chinese pilots boarding passes for himself and his sons, and they are taken on board. The rest are left to freeze in the mountains. The company wanders among the mountains and notices a moving car. Jackson waves his arms frantically and begs it to stop. The driver of the car is the Buddhist monk Nima. He picks up fellow travelers, and together they go to the valley. 
Anheuser, who has arrived at the Arks, is informed that one of the four ships is out of order. It was for this Ark that Karpov had tickets. Helmsley and Laura Wilson, who have become friendly, go to their Ark and ask Anheuser how people were selected for boarding ships. Only now Anheuser tells them that tickets were sold only to rich people. Nobody tried to create the best gene pool for the repopulation of the planet. Helmsley walks into his cabin and realizes that if desired, it can accommodate 10 people, not just him. At the same moment, the astrophysicist Satnam calls him. It turns out that the plane did not come for his family. Satnam reports another giant tsunami, says goodbye to his friend, and dies. Helmsley, in a panic, runs to enter new data and reports that half an hour is left before the wave hits the arcs. At the same time, Nima's car pulls up to the gates of the base. His brother Chinjin refuses to take anyone other than his family. Kate begs Nima's grandmother to at least take the children with her. Looking at Chinjin, Grandma sternly insists on taking everyone. The man reluctantly agrees. At the base, the ticket holders for the malfunctioning arc realize they are being abandoned. Then, under the leadership of Karpov, the distraught crowd rushes to the nearest serviceable Arkansas the one Helmsley just happens to be on. But the ship's gates are already closed on Anheuser's orders. Tianjin quietly leads the company in a roundabout way inside the ship. On the way, they notice Karpov and his children, who cannot get on the Ark. There is a terrible crush on the landing site next to the Ark. Many people cannot hold on and fall into the abyss. Helmsley cannot remain indifferent and addresses the heads of all countries. He asks them to approve the opening of the gate so that those left on the platform can enter the ship. Anheuser interrupts his speech and draws the attention of politicians to the fact that 15 minutes are left before the wave hits. In his opinion, it is much more important to keep the safety of those who are already on the ship. But Helmsley convinces politicians that the future cannot be built from such brutality. In the end, everyone agrees to open the gate. However, this puts Jason's company, which was still wandering the ship's inner recesses, in danger. The movement of the gate's lifting mechanism throws Tianjin and Gordon onto huge spinning gears. Tianjin severely injures his leg, but Jason saves him. But Gordon's grip slips off, and he fails to grab onto Jackson. Gordon is mercilessly grinded by gears. Also, a thick cable gets stuck in the gears. Because of this, the gate mechanism jams, and they do not open completely. Despite this, people quickly run into the ship. There are four minutes left before the wave hits. Everyone is inside, except for Karpov and his children. At the last moment, the man manages to throw his sons into the already closing gate, while he himself falls into the abyss under the ship. Now, all because of the same cable stuck in the gears, the gate does not close completely. Helmsley notices Jason's children in the compartment next to the lifting mechanism, recognizes them and promises Anheuser to fix everything. Helmsley with the workers runs to Jason's compartment. One minute remains before the wave hits, and the gates are still half open. A huge wave approaches the arcs and sweeps away all life in its path. Water gets inside the ship, and the security system blocks some compartments. In particular, the one where Jackson's company is located. Now it is flooded with water. The arc loses its supports, and the engine cannot be started while the gates are open. The ship bobs uncontrollably through the huge waves. The wave carries it straight to Everest. If the engine cannot be started, collision and destruction of the arc cannot be avoided. Helmsley is unable to get to Jackson, but communicates with him through the communication between the compartments. He explains how to unlock the lift mechanism and why it is important to do so immediately. Jackson understands that the descent into the desired compartment, completely flooded with water, is suicide. But he decides to act. The man is quietly followed by his son. Jackson instructs his son to illuminate his way with a flashlight, while he himself begins to pull out the cable. With the help of his son, he succeeds. The gate finally closes and the engine starts. However, the ship is moving up the mountain at too high a speed. Almost no one believes that the engine will be able to move the arc away from the collision. Huge boulders roll down the mountain, which can break the ship. But at the last moment, the arc backs up and moves away from the collision. Jackson emerges from the lift bay and is given a hero's welcome. The man is reunited with his family. On the 27th day after the flood, the water recedes, and the satellites send back pictures of the Earth's surface. Now the mountains in southern Africa have become the pinnacle of the world. Ships with survivors go there. The gates of the Ark open and people come out on deck to admire the new world.